Well, good morning. Um, I doubt very seriously that many of you are going to be uh, watching live. It's uh, somewhere around uh, a little before 1.30 in the morning, but this is the quietest time in my house. And I hope that you have a, a quiet time in your, in your house now and that you've made some time to be quiet here um, this morning, Easter morning. Um, he is risen. Many of us are used to hearing that on Christmas morning. And I know that for many of us, it can be unsettling when we don't hear those around us resound after the pastor says uh, he has risen to hear those around us say he has risen indeed. And I hope that you might take some time, if you have family around, uh, to share in that exclamation together, in that proclamation of the risen Christ. Certainly these have been very tumultuous days. They have been full of turmoil and change and wondering and doubt. And I wonder this morning if you have begun to question where the hope is and whom or what can we hope for how long will we have to hope before hope becomes reality? And it's that this morning that I think maybe speaks most to us this morning on this Resurrection Sunday, this idea of hope. You know, things were changing so rapidly uh, there for so many days. Uh, one news report after another, one order from a governor or the president after another, one mayor after another, one more school, one more business, uh, something shutting down right after the other, one more case, one more toll of how many had been sick, how many were hospitalized. Uh, just uh, a few minutes ago, I was upstairs uh, telling my wife a good night and asking for some tech help, and she showed me that there had been another set of deaths here in town at a local nursing home due to this COVID-19. And so things, when they change that rapidly and that quickly, it can be unsettling to say the least. There's so much contrast from one moment to the next. It's, it's darkness and light. Isn't that the story, right? Dark to light, tribulation to triumph, defeat to victory. And perhaps that's what your life has been like. Maybe perhaps uh, you've seen it the other way. Maybe now you have become accustomed to this quarantine life. And now it seems as though things will never change. When are we going to get back to work? When are we going to be able to go back and gather together? I know that I talked to many um, from the church that I'm pastoring. Um, Many of you know that's Walnut Grove, but for those of you who may be watching that aren't familiar with me or, or with Walnut Grove, um, we're longing to get back together, longing for the day when we can gather together again to worship together, to study God's Word together, to give hugs and reassurance, to confess our sins together, and to hear the assurance of pardon and forgiveness to do all of those things that God has asked us to do and given us the privilege to do as his family. We long for that. And so instead of rapid change, uh, the stress and the anxiety comes from not knowing when things will change again. For how long do we have to only hope? So whether you're struggling with all of the sudden change that's come upon us, or now that you've adjusted to this life, you're growing weary, you're growing anxious, maybe a little stir-crazy, uh, that this is going to go on too long. I think that there is comfort for you in the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Before we begin uh, or go any further, I wonder if you'd just take a moment to pause in prayer with me and to ask for the work of God. Uh, if you're a believer and you're familiar with the Bible, you, you, you're you familiar with the teaching uh, of Paul as the Holy Spirit led him to write to help us to understand that uh, God's Word is not something that the natural person, uh, unaided by the Holy Spirit, can make sense of, can put in the right context, can understand on a level that God has 
doing some work there. It requires a supernatural work because it's a supernatural word. These are not the thoughts and inventions and amusings of man. This is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And if you're, uh, if you're not familiar with the Bible, um, then I would encourage you, uh, if you're watching this, you're probably at least open to the idea that God exists. Maybe he's been working in your life and you don't know uh, exactly who it is, but you know uh, that there is a call going out to you. Maybe you've heard the gospel. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you know something about Jesus. Maybe you know a lot about Jesus. Maybe you grew up in church or around the church and you know about Jesus, but you don't know Jesus or known savingly by him in an intimate relationship with him as he has come to make his home with you. Whatever your case is, I believe that God has endued in, imbued his word with power and that when it's preached, when it's read, when it's spoken, when it's understood, God does what only God can do. God creates life from death. He makes new and something from where there was old or nothing. Only God can do these things. And so I wondered if you would just pause and ask that the power of God in the Holy Spirit might be present in these moments. Father, we do pray, um, for you are the sovereign King and Creator. And so we ask of you, because you also have encouraged uh, your children to address you as a Heavenly Father. And so as a Father, we know that you're willing for good things for your children. And as a sovereign Creator and King, you are able with all the power and all the authority and all the rights to also act upon that which you desire, that for which you're willing. And so we ask, Father, this morning that all those who are in the sound of your words may be moved, may be changed, may be made new, may be made more into the image of Christ inwardly, that the gospel may go out and that any words of mine that are untrue Un, unkind, unloving, unhelpful, unwise. Father, that they would cease to exist in our ears, that they would cease from our memories, that they would fade as quickly as they began, and that all that remain be your words, your wisdom, your love, the one and only truth that is able to change and make new. Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. It was not that long ago, I think it was uh, Friday, um, that I put up a short video on our Facebook page about the sorrow that I had experienced on Thursday, and many of us have. We call that Maundy Thursday, uh, a night when we often think about the, the upper room, uh, the institution of the Lord's Supper or Communion. We think about a night in which Christ um, washed his disciples' feet taught them many difficult lessons. It was a long night, and reading and thinking through uh, the events of the upper room uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Christ prays, sweating great drops of blood, because he knows what's coming. He knows the agony. He knows the loneliness. He knows the denial, the abandonment, the betrayal. He is aware of every bit of pain, from the physical to the emotional to the mental. And to the spiritual, he knows exactly what is going to happen. And he's wrestling in prayer as his closest friends and disciples fall asleep and can't even stay up with him. To the courtyard in the house of Caiaphas where Peter denies him and he is mocked and falsely accused. Then to Pilate's house and from Pilate's to Herod's and then back to Pilate's to be mocked by this Roman who, who doesn't understand what's going on and, and is unwilling to stand up, who tries to set him free, but is really more concerned with his own position and power and eventually hands, these, uh, hands uh, him over to these Jews who want him killed. That long road from there to Calvary, carrying a cross, 
becoming so weak that another man had to carry it the rest of the way for him. The horror of the crucifixion, the darkness, the earthquakes, the crying out to God, the finality of the tomb, the waiting of the disciples and of the women and his followers, days and nights, waiting in confusion and fear and uncertainty. It probably seemed at first so incredibly sudden, things were changing so quickly, people couldn't get their heads wrapped around it. And then after it was over, waiting, where minutes seemed like hours and hours seemed like days, wondering, Is he going to come back? He said he would. Is that what he meant? I never saw it going down like this. I didn't think that he meant that this was going to happen. Did he say that this was going to happen? Replaying in their minds everything that he must have said, trying to figure out what was going to go on. But the reality that they knew as they saw him die, they heard him cry out those that that showed up back on that hill most of them ran but they knew they knew what would happen you know when a change or a disaster um, comes so fast i am reminded of the confusion that began in the upper room the confusion started night before the crucifixion if you have a bible or on a Bible app or anything, turn to the Gospel of John. So in the New Testament, it's the fourth book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and to the 16th chapter. I want to show you um, some of the confusion that ensued. This is, this is uh, an incredible passage where John records a lot of the discussion that went on in the upper room, a lot of the things that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not record. And in chapter 16... Uh, Christ has told them many things. He's told them of the Holy Spirit. He's, he's used pictures and symbols, the vine and the branches, uh, trying to help these men understand uh, what was going on. And then he says this in, in John 16, starting in verse 16. He says, A little while and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while and you will see me. Some of those disciples said to one another, what is, what is this he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me, and because I'm going to my Father. They, they didn't understand what, what he was talking about. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, a little while and you will see me, and again a little while, and you, sorry, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow, but her hour has, but sorrow because her hour has come, that a human being has to be born into the world, has been born into the world. Sorry, <laughs> it's a little bit late. I read that wrong. Excuse me. Let me back up. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish, for for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Jesus makes a very cryptic statement. A little while and you won't see me, and then again a little while and you will see me. What is, what is a little while? They wondered, maybe you wonder, what, what, what is he talking about? A little while and another little while? And then he gives this illustration of labor. You know, most 
labors can differ from person to person. I've never known or heard any stories about anybody giving labor nearly as quickly as my wife, especially with our third, uh, our third little boy. Came in 30 minutes, really. It was an amazing thing. Uh, the first came in in a couple hours, uh, maybe three, but he would have come sooner if we could have been at the hospital sooner. And then our, our middle girl, uh, she came in like an hour, and then Maddox came in 30 minutes. It was, it was incredible. It was definitely only a little while. And compared to the pregnancy, though, no matter how long the labor is, compared to the entire pregnancy, uh, the labor is really only just a little while. It doesn't last long. But even though it doesn't last long, the pain and the, the suffering, if you will, uh, is intense. It's incredibly intense. Um, especially if you if you do this naturally, I assume probably if you, if you use medication to, uh, to block the pain, uh, it's maybe not that painful yet. It, it, nevertheless, it is an intense process. And Either way you go about that, afterwards, despite the most intense pain, there is an overwhelming sense of joy because this one uh, whom you have taken time to grow and get to know and sing to and talk to and nurture and care for and protect uh, for those long months, you can finally look them in the face. Uh, I'll never forget those moments when I saw my child face to face for the first time. The joy and all the, the struggle of pregnancy and all of the, uh, the discomfort and all of those things just seemingly melt away because now, after a short while of pain and suffering, there is this little one. There is this new birth. There is this joy. And it's not really even that the suffering gives way to joy, or when the suffering is done, then joy will come along on its own. It really is, in a sense, that the suffering produces the joy, you see, in a normal, natural sense, as it would have been when Christ was speaking here. They didn't have C-sections and epidurals and all of those things. And, and so when he speaks of labor, he speaks of a natural childbirth, right? No drugs. Uh, no, no, no surgeries, uh, just a woman giving birth to a child in the most natural of ways. It's a painful process. And without the pain, without the travail, without the struggling uh, in labor, the child doesn't come forth. It's not going to happen by itself. The woman, any woman who's given natural childbirth will tell you it's, it's, it's a lot of work. It's one of the hardest things that I think a human being could possibly do. As I was studying uh, anatomy uh, in college, a professor once said that uh, uh, childbirth is the largest wound anybody, any human being ever receives and lives to talk about. It's a traumatic experience, but without that work, without that striving, without that labor, without the pain, there is no joy. In fact, it is the pain of working through that suffering that produces the joy. And I think that's what, cre that was what Christ is saying here. You're going to suffer. But unless I do this, unless I go, and in fact, he's already made the comment some verses late, earlier. If you have it there, just look back in uh, chapter 16 there, at verse 7. I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come. In other words, He's trying to explain to them that there's actually something that needs to happen. And if he doesn't go away, and he knows the means by which he's going to go away, but if he doesn't go away, the thing that needs to happen, the one who needs to come, is not going to be able to come. In fact, it is this pain, this suffering that produces the joy. It is, the, if you like, the raw materials. If you're still there in your Bible, if you turn... Uh, to the right, uh, to Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians, in the fourth chapter, 2 Corinthians four, seventeen. Paul says this, 
2 Corinthians 4, 17, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. This suffering that I'm going through is working to produce glory. In fact, it is a momentary affliction. It is a little while of suffering, and it is an eternal blessing, an eternal glory. The pain is for a little while, and it is in fact producing the blessing. So many people spend so much time trying to alleviate pain and run away from difficulty or, or teach that uh, if you're having difficulty in your life that, that that's not God. Friend, God is sovereign. It was God who led Paul to the places Paul went and through the things that Paul went through. It was God, God the Holy Spirit, who drove um, Christ into the desert to be tempted. It was God who led Christ to the cross. It was God the Father who punished Christ on the cross for the sins of his people. God is sovereign. And God is sovereign over suffering. Now, God doesn't do evil. But God is so good and so sovereign that even the evil that happens cannot happen unless he has ordained that it should happen. It's not the same as actively being the primary cause of that evil. People make wicked, sinful choices. But that is why we have a promise from God that he is always working out his purposes. Ephesians 1.11, he's working all things according to the counsel of his own will. Furthermore, that his will includes the good of his people and that all those things are working together for the good of his people, those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So there is this little suffering that takes place. Well, I wonder if now you're asking me, say, John, this is, this is, this is Easter. Easter's about the resurrection. When do we get to that? You're talking a lot about suffering, but you know, if, if you're watching this on Sunday morning, uh, all the suffering is over now, right? Well, it was actually through the suffering of the cross that which would bring grief and pain not only to Jesus, but to his followers, this, this little while of suffering, these days and nights of waiting, unsure, unsure, afraid, but hopeful that this joy would be complete, that this joy would proceed not only, uh, or be produced not only in the 11 and some of those close friends like Mary and Martha, but for all of those who would be brought to faith through the power of the gospel of, of a risen Christ. The hope is, the joy, the comfort of the resurrection is, that the joy they experienced on Sunday in seeing the risen Christ, they understood was produced by making it through that suffering and that as we go through our suffering, we understand, as Paul said here, that these afflictions produce for us an eternal weight of glory. I wonder if you'll just take a moment to look at the context of that verse. It's, it's rarely ever uh, best to read one verse by itself. Sometimes you can uh, get an appropriate meaning from that, but context is key. And in this case, Context doesn't necessarily change the meaning of that verse in any way, as though we might have un misunderstood it, but it certainly helps us see the broader picture. I wonder if you'll just zoom out a little bit with me there in 2 Corinthians. And if we start there in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 7, listen again to the context of his statement to the believers in Corinth. Here's what he writes. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. 
We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So, death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe, so we also speak, knowing that he, here it is, who raised the Lord Jesus, he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. He continues, for we know now, chapter 5, we know that if the, the tent, that is a temporary dwelling, that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building that is a permanent dwelling, a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Isn't that where some of us have been? As we see the suffering that goes on around us and we just want to be home. We just want to be done with this temporary life, this world that is uh, writhing in suffering and in pain. We long to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked, for while we are still in this tent we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that would be that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. I want you to remember that. He who has prepared us for this very thing, this permanent heavenly dwelling, the joy produced by making it through the suffering, he who has prepared us for that is God, and he has given us a guarantee in the Spirit. So we are always of good courage. Are you of good courage? I hope so. I hope that you will be. We are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. You see, there's a lot to say about how we get through the suffering. God has brought us to this. Some people like to say if God brings you to it, He'll bring you through it. And there's some truth in that, isn't there? It is God who has brought us to all of these things and prepared us for all of these things, not just for what is waiting for us, but for where we are now. You see, we don't have to wait to be guided and looked after and protected and moved by God and changed by God. He is doing it right now. I hope that you believe that. And that means that right now, while we suffer in this time of a pandemic, in this time of waiting, in this time of loneliness, in this time of uncertainty, that God is at work now. God has prepared us also for this and is preparing us 
for what is to come. See, it is because he lives. Did you catch that? If the resurrection of Christ is what gives life. In fact, it is. That's what he said, right? It is the resurrection of Christ that gives life and hope and a future with God to the believer. We're reminded of Paul's words in his first letter to the Corinthians, aren't we? That, that chapter uh, on the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. Do you remember what Paul says? Paul says this, And if Christ has not been raised, in other words, if there was no resurrection, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If Christ, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people to be most pitied. Because he lives, we who have been buried with Christ will also be raised with Christ. That's Romans 6. 1 to 11. If you've been buried with Christ, then you will be raised with Christ. And it's interesting as you read that passage there in Romans 6 and so much of the New Testament that there is sort of an already raised and a not yet raised aspect that we are raised or have been raised. Also, it talks about us in, in the sense that we will be raised. There's sort of an already and a not yet. What's happened already is that we are raised to new life, raised spiritually. If you want to jot some of these down and look them up later, I encourage you to take the time. Ephesians 2, I think you can see this whole process, can't you? That when we come to faith in Christ, it truly is a resurrection. Ephesians 2 starts with saying that we're dead. Ephesians 2 verse 1, and you were dead in trespasses and sins. Paul's already made it clear that's applying to every human being. Dead, not sick, not injured, not drowning and waving our hand for help, not sick on a, on a deathbed needing medicine and having to take it or having to reach out and grab something of our own. We're dead. Dead men can't do anything on their own. In other words, we're completely and totally helpless Paul says in Romans um, eight that or Romans seven that there's nothing good that lives in the flesh. Nothing. Romans eight he says that the flesh is hostile to God and cannot submit. It can't. Jesus in John six says that the flesh profits nothing. It's no help at all. So we're dead. And then he goes on there in verse four of Ephesians two to say, but God. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up, verse 6. Raised, that's past tense. God did what? He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places so that in a very real sense, those who have believed in Christ have already experienced a resurrection of sorts from death to life and have been seated. Paul speaks about this also in Colossians chapter 2. He says many of the same kinds of things. I just want to reaffirm and, and, and reinforce this in your mind, Colossians 2, Paul says this, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive. You who were dead, God made alive. That's a resurrection, isn't it? The dead come to life. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us our trespasses and canceling our debt. And so, in a very real sense, we have already experienced a spiritual resurrection. I think this is the first resurrection that John speaks about in Revelation 20. Those who experienced the first resurrection, 
the second death has no power over. But there's an already and there's a not yet. What we've not yet been resurrected bodily. Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians 15 about the bodily resurrection that we will experience. We hear in Revelation 20 also about a bodily resurrection which will come about. In John 6, I mentioned this earlier before, Jesus uses uh, future tense words. In John 6, I wonder if you just look briefly at verse 37. All the Father gives me will come, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks to on the Son, and believes in Him, should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. See, the last day hasn't happened yet. He goes on even further in verse 44. No one can come to the, me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Repeatedly, Jesus connects belief in Him through faith having been drawn by the Father and given life and the ability to see Christ for who he is and love him and have faith in him, every one of those whom the Father has given to the Son, every one of them will come, none of them will be turned away, and every one of them will be raised up on the last day. You see, the bodily part hasn't happened yet. I wonder if you just go a chapter before. See, Jesus put this so beautifully, all really in one chapter, in John 5. If you start in verse 21, where he says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, okay, that's a resurrection, raising the dead, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. You see the sovereignty of God in grace, in salvation. And he goes on to talk further about this resurrection when you get to verse 24. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Has. Those who were dead have life. They have been raised. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Has passed from death to life. There has been a resurrection. Whoever believes has been raised to new life. Do you believe that Christ is the Son of God? That he died for sinners? And that mercy and grace and forgiveness can be found only through faith in him and a complete trust that only Christ's perfect sacrifice will satisfy the justice of God and therefore afford the believer status as a son or daughter, as an heir, forgiven, free, and accepted in Christ. Well, he goes on to say, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear and the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. But listen very carefully. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man Verse 28, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming. This time he doesn't say, and it's now here, does he? An hour is coming. When all who are in tombs, he doesn't say it the same way, does he? There's an already, and there's a not yet. What's not yet? All who are in tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of the judgment. One bodily resurrection on the last day. But there's a resurrection that happens before already spiritually and then not yet bodily, but it is coming. They are one and the same and our suffering in this life will produce for us and for God an eternal glory, darkness giving way 
to and being driven away by light, a glory which we do not yet have or know in full, but was promised to us. So we've experienced part, but not all of it. We've sort of had a down payment, haven't we? And that's the language that we find. Because we are made to wait, because we are uh, graciously given the privilege to wait, to suffer, to grow through that darkness, through that pain, to produce that eternal weight of glory for us. Because we are made to wait, God graciously gives us an assurance, an abiding assurance through the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. He spoke about it, uh, Jesus did in John 14, when he says he's with you and he will be in you. And if I go, then he will come. But if I don't go, he won't come. So it was necessary for the suffering to happen so that the helper would come. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 tells us this very thing, doesn't it? After it explains the sovereign work of, of God the Father and God the Son, the author, the accomplisher, and now how it is applied to us, the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. Ephesians 1, 13 in him, also when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of the inheritance that is yet to come. We're given life now, brought to life now. The Holy Spirit is a down payment. And those who have the Spirit are new. They are new creations as we await the totality or the consummation of the new heaven and the new earth, the entire new creation. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22 and 5, we, we read these things. It's a guarantee of what was promised, a down payment. Guarantees assure those to whom they are given of the faithfulness of the promise promisor, of the promise maker, and the value of that which was promised. And these assurances, these down payments, these guarantees are needed by the promisees, those who receive the promise, especially during times of hardship and trial, uncertainty, doubt, loss, difficulty. A guarantee gives hope, endurance, and it glorifies and it vindicates the promise maker when the full payment is delivered. So as we close now, I want to take you to Paul's letter to the Romans. So we hopefully tie this together. Romans 8. Romans 8, 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. It is the Spirit who gives life now and promises full life in the future to come. And so then as you move over, you continue to read through chapter 8. You come to 18, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Many of you friends, I, I know that during this time you have suffered. You may have suffered a physical loss of health or of a loved one, financial loss, loss of security, loss of income, loss of hope. Whatever it is that you're suffering here and now, the Apostle Paul assures you that if Christ is in you and you have a guarantee of something greater that is waiting for you, that whatever we suffer now is not worth comparing to what is waiting for us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, 
but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And here it is, Romans 8, 23, and not only creation, but we ourselves who have, that's present tense, the first fruits of the Spirit. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eager, eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. That's the not yet, that's what's to come. The already, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. The not yet, we wait for the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. I've been going through Genesis with the kids in the morning and we've made it to Genesis 8, and we hear that wonderful statement of, of God after Noah has survived this flood, he and his family, and in, verse, uh, or in chapter 8, he tells them, go out from the ark and, and live and, and multiply, and, and Noah worships God. In John 11, I think of Jesus in verse 43 when he tells Lazarus to come out of the tomb and he lives and he is unwrapped and set free. And I think of the church. The word in, in Greek that's used is ekklesia, the called out ones. We've been called out of death into life. We have a down payment. We have an already, we have a spiritual resurrection, a new life, and a guarantee through the Holy Spirit who not only gives us life now, but promises us a full life for eternity that is not even worth comparing. This, this suffering is not even worth comparing to the greatness of what awaits us. And on that note then, Paul then says these things. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. I know we have weaknesses. These difficult times, stress shows us where our weaknesses are. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought to. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. I wonder if you have lost the will or the wisdom to pray and you don't know what to pray. If you're a child of God, be reassured that the Spirit intercedes for you. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Rest now, friends, in this promise, Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose and say all things were good friends no he has brought us to a time of suffering that it may produce in us the image of christ and a a, a, a glory that is far beyond comparing to the suffering itself christ himself suffered for our sake and to him is given the greatest glory. So as we close this Easter, beloved, keep the faith, abound in joy, abide in peace, and endure in hope. For lightness, light will overcome and has overcome the darkness. In this world we will have trouble, the Lord said. But take heart. I have overcome the world. May God bless you.